We're delighted to welcome Jerry Sussman. Um, Jerry has done lots of pioneering work in programming languages and software design and mechanics and uh, symbolic computation um, and recently published a book about, um, about flexibility. patterns for flexibility, flexibility which he's going to tell us about. Okay. Hi. First of all, I want to thank uh, the two prece preceding speakers for talking about something very wonderful that I rarely think about myself. In particular, it's what you want. You see, they're asking what it is that you, that you want out of a system. Okay? I'm the opposite of this. I'm a plumber. I've, when I figure out what I want, now the question is how do I wire it together? So I'm going to talk to you about plumbing. Okay, I'm a, I want to show how to, the ways of making systems that have the property that you can, you write this big pile of code, and you know, you, you get, all of a sudden, it's, gee, I have a different problem I have to solve. Why can't I use the same piece of code? Why can't I, for example, uh, just add another feature? Why is it that somehow I've built myself, programmed myself into a corner? That's what I'm going to try to give us a feeling for how to avoid. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little history of me. Uh, I'm, I'm the oldest guy here probably. And way back when I first started programming computers, that's what they looked like. Uh, this was a uh, $3.5 million computer in 1962. Okay? And uh, by golly, it could barely do, I mean, you're, you, let's just say a, a desk calculator now could do far better than this. Okay? Uh, this is a, that's an IBM 7094. Uh, and then here's me in 68 sitting at the, uh, at the PDP-6. Okay, doing some programming. The important thing I'm telling you right now is that having been programming since then and continuing to program, I never turned into a manager or anything like that. I've always been a programmer because I love it and I do it all, I, I, I write some code every day because it's fun, okay? Having done that, I know more ways to screw yourself with the programming than anybody else I know, okay? I have learned all the ways to get to, get to screw up, okay? So let me talk about that idea, okay? So here's what I want. What I want is robust systems that have the following property, that they're generalizable in the sense that there are ways that it has, has more, far more that they're able to do than, in fact, you've designed them to do. That it's possible to, to, to use them in ways you hadn't thought of. Okay? That's very important. That they're evolvable. Evolvable meaning, by the way, is this a, is this a uh, what am I doing here? What's the button that produces? Never mind. I got something better. Okay? They're evolvable. Okay? Whoops. Ah, it's good. Okay, I've just discovered something. Okay? <laughs> okay. They're evolvable in the sense that they can be adapted to new jobs without, without modification. That's interesting. That they're tough. Adding a feature doesn't, doesn't make the old features go away. And one of the nice things about that is that, as an example, Emacs. Emacs has been around for about 40 years. Okay. It's about 10,000 people have contributed to it, making, making additions. It, not only does it still work, and it works great, and it's completely reliable, but in fact, it's accumulated these very large numbers of applica basically applications, and it works fine. It's really an operating system, and that's a good way to, to, to play it. That's what I want, things like that. How do you make things like that that have that kind of life? Okay. So one of the things that's wrong with the world is we have a lot of people who have religions about how to program. Okay, there, you know, yeah, I, I remember way back when there was a fellow by the name of Dijkstra, he used to consider the right thing to do is you beat up the programmer until he does a good job. Okay? You're not allowed to, he's not allowed to, you're not allowed to uh, program until you've proven, you've been made a complete plan, you've proved out everything, and then you write the code. It doesn't work. It's a very bad idea. But there's also other things like that. There's a whole bunch of these individual religions, each of which is good for some particular problems, but not good for a lot of problems. Each one works in some places and not in others. Okay? That's a, that's, yeah, I, I, a real engineer needs a tool cut kit. And you have to be able to use those tools together to be able to solve bigger problems than you could solve with any one of these ideas. Okay, so the problem with these ideas is every one of these has a bunch of ontological commitments that, that require the programmer to make. Okay, and I want, want to make sure that, in fact, we don't think that we have, to, we have to make these ontological commitments. We have to be able to use these ideas without committing to them so that we can't, so that we can't use another idea in the same piece of machinery that we're building, whatever it is. Okay? So I want to start with, with good ideas. Here's a good idea. Okay? I've got a backbone. I've got legs, four, you know, four, four limbs, a head, okay? just like that frog. 
Okay, there's a standard body plan for a vertebrate creature. There it is, okay, uh, well, at least a land-based vertebrate creature. That idea is pretty uniform and universal. Engineering, we have the same idea. A superheterodyne radio receiver invented by Major Edwin Armstrong in 1918 okay, did the right thing too. He made a body plan. The body plan, what I mean by a body plan, look, is this, the way this frog works, the same way all, of, all animals work, is these Hox genes. The Hox genes say, they, take, they, say read, they define regions, a coordinate system from nose to tail. It doesn't say what goes in each of those places. It just says that there's a coordinate system and divides it up like that. Okay? For example, uh, hemichordate, that's something like an uh, acorn worm, happens to have its, happens to have its kidneys in its nose. Okay? Just it happens to be true. Okay? But at least it has the same exact Hox genes that describe the nose to tail coordinate system. What's going on here is the same thing with the super night radio receiver. This could have been, this could be di uh, FM detector, AM detector, video detector, the digital thing, IQ. Okay, it could be this, uh, what the, this, this uh, uh, converter could be uh, recursive. It could be a multiple recursion, uh, conversion receiver for, for uh, communications receiver type purpose. The critical idea that Mr. A Edwin Armstrong invented was the idea of separating of concerns. Specifically, the concern of dividing up band, selectivity for bands for selectivity from interchannels. The channel selectivity is done by the IF filter, and the RF filter determines which band you're in. And that made, that's an incredible advance in, the, in, in making radio equipment. Okay. And almost every radio, by the way, receiver until about re very recently was made exactly according to that plan. I'm talking recently, meaning the last 10 years. There are plans in, bio, in software, too, like this. A tensor combiner, okay? Meaning tensor, meaning literally uh, the way you have it in, in, uh, in mathematics, okay? What you do is you take, you have an N plus M argument system, you, uh, argument, you bring in N of them go one way, M of them go the other, you process each of those, and you combine the results. That's a plan, okay? And it doesn't say what goes into each of these things. In real tensors, of course, is linear systems, but that's not the point. The point is this is a, a general plan. This map reduce was invented by actually Dick Waters in 1978 in his doctoral thesis about the fact that he analyzed, what is it, uh, very, uh, it was 95% of all the, all the uh, programs in the IBM Scientific Subroutine Library were, could be described as a combination like this. Okay, that's, that was a, a software plan. We, I, I tend to like programming languages with lots of parentheses. If you don't like it, you can leave. Okay, that's a separate issue. The point is that they, they, the really nice thing about these parentheses and this language is it's so simple that it doesn't have any, there's no syntax. So I don't have to worry about it. Uh, anyway, there's a composition plan. A composition plan just says if I've got functions f and g, I put them together, I get a composition f composed g, and I can use it. Okay? And then I can, you know, make things out of it and all that. That's a particular plan saying it's a sequence of things happening in a, in a row. That's all. Okay, there are many, many other plans like that. Let's talk about another kind of thing going on here. You saw my first uh, uh, frog. The first frog back here, just to remind you, that guy uh, is the kind that you meet in, in Vermont, and I took that picture. Okay, this is, a, this is a standard ordinary frog. But it turns out that uh, way back a long time ago, uh, Delpino and Ellenson discovered this kind of frog in, in, in Central America or South America, I forgot where. Okay, and this frog, is it also a frog. That is, if you took it apart as an adult, you'd say the same parts. It has, a, it has a GI tract, it has backbone, it has legs, it's the same body plan. It's actually undeniably a frog. Except that it turns out that it's embryologically very different. The first frog that you saw, which is the one when you were, when you were in high school and they made you, uh, made you say, uh, uh, watch a frog's egg turn into a tadpole. Okay, and you look at the microscope and you see it divides this way and this way and this way and various, you know, it's a little round thing. Well, it turns out this guy is, a, is more like a chicken. That is, it grows a, 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 it's on a yolk sac and it grows a streak. Okay, and the streak, uh, it turns out different embryological tissues combine to make the same organs in the other, that the other frog does. So there's two ways to make a frog. Hmm. Okay, that, that fact, there's multiple ways to make a frog. Why don't we do that in programming? Okay, well, we have the same thing happening in, 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 in theoretical physics. 
Okay, we have if we want to understand, for example, uh, how to uh, how to evaluate, get the equations of motion for some interesting dynamical system. Okay, and we're dealing with with variational mechanics. There's the Hamiltonian method, and there's the Lagrangian method, and they're actually the same. They're really closely related. Okay, but there are two ways to do it. Sometimes, if you're looking at the, I want to understand the symmetries of the system. You want the Lagrangian system view. If you want to deal with uh, special relativity or general relativity, you want the Lagrangian view. If you want to deal with quantum mechanics, you use the Hamiltonian view. Okay, that's it's all they. they but when they are this, when they are about the same thing, they get the same answers, okay? Because the equations of motion are integrated the same way right here, okay? This is the state, uh, the state bus, okay? And it happens to be redundant because we have both the velocity and the momentum, okay? But there, it's redundant in some ways, but it's absolutely essential that you have both of them together. You need to use both to solve problems where, where you need, you need to, to go between the, the ways of looking at something and seeing how it works. If you want to understand something, you might use Hamiltonian rather than Lagrangian. Okay? We don't do this in programs. Why? Well, we, I really would like it that way. We, often, we should have multiple ways of, of solving a problem in, every, in programs all the time. We don't do it because it's expensive to have multiple ways. You have to write several pieces of code. That's one thing. Okay? Maybe we think there's a best way, which is probably not true, to solve some problem. Uh, we don't have nice mechanisms to combine planning system uh, ways. Okay? In multiple ways can be an advantage if correctly coordinated. In a critical system, multiple ways provide cross-checks. If we solve the problem two ways, we can see whether we get the same answer, approximately. If we don't get the same answer, something's wrong. Maybe we've got to have been attacked. Or maybe there's, a, maybe there's some bug that we don't know about. Okay? Uh, there are often cases where one way is better than the other. For example, there are quick and dirty ways to solve problems, which don't always work, and then there are slow, slow and, and uh, guaranteed ways that work every time. And how do we, why don't we solve the things? Why don't we want to use both? We, get both? we somehow want to get both advantages there. Okay? And one of the nicest thing is what evolution tells us about I mean, creatures. Okay? If you have multiple ways to solve a problem, then there's a room for evolution. There's more than one way to, to cut up, uh, say, glucose. Okay, then by golly, if one of them, if there's multiple ways, then you can change one of them a little bit and see if, without damaging the other, and you, the creature still survives. Okay, you can improve one without worrying about whether the other one gets, get, gets broken, the whole system gets broken. So this is a, a very nice thing. Okay, now, well, I actually do this all the time, personally. Okay, I'm going to show you an example, but it doesn't matter. Okay, here's an example. There are ways of okay, so finding out whether something's an element of a list. A membership. Okay? The, if the list happens to be a plain ordinary list, it's easy. You go blah, 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 and you look at every element okay? until you find whether or not it's there. Okay? They, however, that list might be, the list might be, might be circular, in which case if it's not, the element's not there, you're going to an infinite loop. Bad idea, but that's a quick and dirty way to solve the problem. A much, a much uh, safer way is by, may, by leaving a string behind me, right? the Theseus and Ariadne algorithm. Okay, you basically uh, drop, a, drop a little, uh, little pieces of goodies or whatever, and you see whether you see them again when you come back to the same place you started from. You can do that with a hash table. This is much slower, but it works every time. Okay? Well, if you, used, if you, uh, if you uh, are willing to have two threads okay, besides the main thread, you make two threads, one of which it does one way and one does the other way, and whichever one converges first, you take, and you kill the other one. Okay, it's called the time-sharing conspiracy. We'll not worry, not worry about that right now. <clears throat> okay? Let's talk about more uh, other things. I like to think from a, start with a biological inspiration because nature has discovered almost all the clever things that, that could possibly happen uh, in the last few billion years. Okay? And we, we really better learn from it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's sort of amazing to realize what amazing code we, we are made out of. Uh, you probably don't recognize or probably don't know that your human genome is about a gigabyte. That's about the size of Microsoft Word. Okay? So it's a, so we, the, all the instructions to make you from a single cell, to run you for about 70 years, okay, to keep you from uh, being eaten by other things of the same sort, all that code fits into a gigabyte. And what, it's also super, super flexible. Change only a little bit and you get a rabbit instead. Okay, so it seems to me that we really have a lot to learn. Anyway, one of the things nature does is it, it's very expensive. It does expensive things. It does generate and test. Here's an example of a question. How do you make a cell have a shape? 
You know, cells, cells, you know, a cell is sort of a, a blob of stuff. And, you know, normally it would just become a, a, a spherical if you, if you left it alone. The point is it has an internal cycle, a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made out of things called, for example, tubulin. There's various, there's uh, microtubules made out of tubulin. There's actin fil filaments. There's other kinds of filaments. And they combine to produce a structure which then produces a shape. Like, for example, a neuron is long and thin and has, has, has an axon with, uh, with, uh, with special end nodes on them. How does it do that? Well, there's a, for example, one part of it is, is where does the tubulin come from? There's a, a centrosome somewhere near the nucleus, and it grows this tubulin protein, okay, which by, by adding monomers, and it also subtracts them. It's basically very unstable, this protein. It expands, contracts, and you have zillions of these little plot fibers going out. And some of them get stabilized when they hit the membrane, saying something interesting there. Ooh, that's how you make a, you hold the shape. But you have try, it tries everything and then produces a, 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 a shape. There's a generate and test trick that's happening. And we don't do that very much in programming because it's expensive. Nature is pretty, says, well, the cell is pretty cheap. Okay? Even, even ATP is pretty cheap once, which is energy in a, in a eukaryotic cell because we've taken over all these nice, um, ni nice uh, mitochondria as slaves, okay, basically. Uh, that's, so there's plenty of energy to use up. But in any case, you know, we can do this with, 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 with and, and languages too. We can add to it McCarthy's AMB operator, which is AMB of A, B, and C is A or B or C, but I don't know which one. It's, de it's, it's, it's defined to be non-deterministic search. Okay? It's, it's modeling non-deterministic automata. And so you can invent something which has AMB in it. Okay? For example, an integer between low and high is, is either low or an integer between low plus one and high basically, but we don't know which it is, OK? That's, now, once you do that, you can define Pythagorean triples, and you can find all the Pythagorean triples be, uh, between 1 and 20, and there they are, OK? It's a very simple program. Then why do we want such a thing? Why do we want something like that? The reason is because exactly what happened in, can I go back on this thing? Yes, the reason is because exactly what's going here. It's a separation of concerns. How to actually do something and how to make the possibilities versus how to select the possibilities. Okay? That's a, once you can separate concerns, you can do all sorts of things that make your, make your system simpler and more modular. It costs. It's very expensive. So you've got to be careful because you can make exponential searches this way. Right? But of course. So that's a, you've got to be careful. And in fact, here I say that. Making a search easy is dangerous. Search is exp potentially exponential. A lazy programmer can use search to avoid making a better algorithm. Fine. I'm not a lazy programmer. I use it when I need it. Okay? Uh, generate and test is a value. It's literally this. Okay? And we can, uh, there are clever tricks for optimizing searches that they use in SAT solvers. Okay? But there are even more general things which were invented by me and actually Richard Stallman in 19, 1975. Holy shit. Okay, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> it's a, that's right. Okay, the other thing that I'm going to tell you about is generic operations. Okay? Most people think generic operations, well, you, you see them in Python and stuff like that. Languages allow you to mix things in arithmetic so I can deal with integers, I can deal with, uh, with fractions, I can mix the integers and fractions, I can deal with, with, with a decimal inexact numbers, and I can get terrible disasters with inexact numbers. For example, the square root, the square root of the square root of 2 is not 2. Okay? That's a well-known feature. In fact, most people don't realize just how horrible floating point is. Okay? The only thing that scares me in programming is floating point. I am really afraid to, use, to fly in an airplane because it was designed by programmers using floating point arithmetic. The only reason an airplane is safe is because there's a test pilot. I just want to be very clear about that. Uh, so I can show, after this, I'll show anybody who wants that it's easy to make, to show that the average of two numbers is not necessarily between them. Okay, if you, with very simple example. Anyway, so I scare people with that all the time. But indeed, it's still a very useful thing to be able to mix things like that. But it's more powerful than that. What if I allow extensible generics? 
Most languages don't have that, although Python has this with dunder methods, right? Double underscore magic methods, but that's a kludge. It's not, it's not universal in general. It doesn't, really, it doesn't really work quite right. But in the Lisp world, it does work because the, name, the word, the symbol plus, is just the name of something, which I can give it, see, give it some other thing. It's its value. Okay? But in any case, I can you know, generalize addition and multiplication and so on to deal with, with, ve with vectors with, uh, over r to the n. I can deal with functions. So I, the sum of two functions is the, fu is the sum of the, the values. Okay, I can do all that sort of thing. Nice. That's very nice. Okay? But the thing that most people don't realize is automatic differentiation is just a generic extension of arithmetic. You know, people would write paper after paper on automatic differentiation. It was a lot of work for years. It's trivial, OK? Here's an example. The derivative of cosine is just minus sine, of course. And the second derivative of cosine is minus cosine, as you expect, OK? But and, you know, you can take an arbitrarily defined procedure, uh, 1 half at square, OK, is the how same drops. The derivative of that for 32 feet per second square is that 2 is 64 feet per second. That's, you know, that, all that works. You can make derivatives work. Why? OK. Well, it's a trick. The trick is this one. You invent, a new, just like we can invent complex numbers or rational numbers, they're a kind of pair. You have something called the dual number which was, by the way, invented by a very smart mathematician by the name of Clifford in 1873. You may have heard of Clifford algebras and things like that. Anyway, he invented dual numbers, which have finite parts and infinitesimal parts. He had different names for them. Okay? And uh, what you do is you extend all the arithmetic primitives, just like you did for, for, for things like vectors or matrices or, or whatever you want. You extend them to dual numbers, and you get this. The, the dual, if I take x and dx as a dual number, I put it through f, I get f of x and the derivative of f at x times dx. Okay? That means that because the chain rule is the critical thing in, in derivatives, it's really with the center of the whole idea, then I can put that object through g and I get exactly the right, the right derivative here. So if all I have to do is divide out by delta x, okay, and I get dg of f of x, times df at x. It's exactly right. It's, it's much simpler than what they, the way they draw it in, in 1801, okay, using Mr. Leibniz's notation, which is terrible for other reasons. Very confusing when you're dealing with high dimensional spaces, things like that, whereas, whereas this, this kind of derivative is functional derivatives are now, are now pretty much what people use in real math. Okay. okay, so this is, all you have to do is do that and everything starts working. You get derivatives, just like you got complex number arithmetic or rational number arithmetic or whatever you want. Okay? Now, so once you do that, you can also do other things by, by, by making it work. You can add units. It's just another piece of, uh, another kind of, of uh, thing. You know, the charge on an electron here, E, is that many coulombs, 10 to the minus, it's got a funny, I probably have to put bars here because it's a funny kind of print, okay, that I can't do, you know, I couldn't just write out the value. And there's Boltzmann's constant, and it's in uh, kilogram meter square per Kelvin second square, okay? And if I say uh, Boltzmann's constant, K, K times, a, a t, a KT over the charge of an electron, we all know as electro, electrical engineers, is 26 millivolts, right? That's a diode, it's a silicon diode drop. Okay, when you forward bias it. And you know, if I wanted it all generous, but once you do that, it all works. Just everything works. The, the definite integral of the Earth's mass, uh, you know, time, uh, divided by the square of the Earth's radius with, an, uh, with a little bit of extra stuff, R, if I go from zero meters to one meters, tells me it takes 9.8 joules to, to lift something one meter. Okay? But this is all just generic arithmetic. That is extremely dangerous. You've got to be careful, because after all, supposing you have an algorithm that that's, uh, you're doing with num a numerical algorithm that does something, and you choose to generalize it to matrix arithmetic, but you accidentally used a, a commutation rule in, the, in your original 
uh, numerical algorithm, which is not going to work for matrices because matrix is a multiplication not commutative, you've produced a bug, completely novel kind of bug you wouldn't have expected. So it's dangerous. But if done right, the only thing that breaks is the new thing you built. That's what I teach my classes, how to do that so that no matter what happens, the old stuff keeps working and you just have to debug the new stuff. Okay, that you put in, the extensions. Okay? So you even act yet, you can easily make it do generalized algebra too. Once you, once you have this, all, all now I just have symbolic quantities. I, I made a, a nasty by using the quoted, quoted symbol to be a, a, a real number, a literal real number. It really should be something that's typed real, okay? Literal real. But by golly, you know, uh, x, x minus y times x plus y is x squared minus y squared. You know, it is, okay? And just start having algebra start working just like that. Okay, it just works, okay? And so if I start with the, the, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, li, uh, I can use literal functions, which means functions that we know nothing about other than their name, okay? Well, I can take the derivative of that at a time t, and I get, yes, indeed, the momentum times the, the, the rate of change of the velocity, which is exactly right, okay? You know, and that's all, so all these things work, okay? just by, by, by generic extension. Okay. People, people don't realize that. Yeah, you can get them with units. <laughs> okay. The whole thing works with units. Okay. So it, you know, I get joules out. Okay. Of course, this is very powerful and very dangerous. But I like to live dangerously. Because what I care about is not whether or not the thing I made is right on the, at, the, at the beginning. What I care about is I can debug it. And I care about that I can understand it, and it's easy for me to do this. I can build whatever the hell I want very, very fast. Okay? Takes me, takes me a few hours to, 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 make, to make an arbitrary extension, and I have stuff that I can show to my class the, the next day. That's the kind of thing that matters. It seems to me that a lot of our, a lot of our software, we spend how much time are we sitting around trying to figure out what I did wrong? How did I make something that I can't extend? It's because I'm not using clever ideas like this. I've only given you three of them. I've been in this business so long that I have hundreds of them. Okay, that I just understand how to avoid programming yourself into a corner. Okay, so I'm teaching you plumbing. That's what I'm interested in. Okay? And indeed, oh yes, here's just examples, a few more that I can tell you about. I'm not too happy about proofs. I have lots of friends who like proofs. I, I love to talk about them this afternoon. Okay? They're, they're good sometimes. The problem is not the proofs. Proofs are great. I'm an old math type. I really like proofs. The difficulty is how you write the specification. Are you going to specify, how are you going to specify Microsoft Word? Okay, what does it mean? Okay, what is it? It hasn't even the foggiest idea. How do you specify? How do you specify? You can specify certain properties. It will not write a file. It will not delete a file that it hasn't already. When it's writing out a file, it doesn't rename it until it, you know, until after it's, uh, it's, it doesn't delete it until it's after it's remained, renamed it or the right thing like that. Okay, so, so there's certain properties you could write, but there are things you can't say. Like, we've got a chess program. I can prove that, it, possibly prove that it plays legal chess. How am I going to prove that it plays good chess? What's that mean? We have no idea what, that, what to say. So almost all the things that we really want to do are not specifiable in any reasonable way. Because they're mostly a matter of, of preferences we have that are very complicated and we don't have any words to describe them yet. Maybe in 100 years we will. But now I don't think we have words to describe most of the things where we would have want to prove. So I have lots and lots of, lots and lots of, uh, of ideas that I uh, try to teach people about. And this is like, only one page of this kind of stuff. But indeed, uh, I've written several books about this. The, the most recent one, which is about this, okay, with my friend Chris Hansen, who uh, worked for me for 26 years at MIT as a, a research scientist, and then he went to Google and spent 10 years there, and then he came back and wrote a book with me. Okay? Uh, but, but this is about how do you avoid programming, that, that new book, how to avoid programming yourself in a new corner. Okay? All of these techniques that you just saw are used in stuff that I've done to make up 
classes that I teach other kinds of things. Not only do I teach computer science or electrical engineering, I also teach theoretical physics okay, with my friend Jack Wisdom. And indeed, we wrote two books about this, Structure Interpretation of Classical Mechanics and uh, Functional Differential Geometry, which is actually about the chapter six, is the problem sets general relativity. Uh, it turns out these are very, very simple. And by using programming as the way of expressing the ideas besides the traditional mathematics, in addition to, you make it unambiguous, clar clear, and therefore easy to read. Okay? I can read a program because it doesn't leave out any, any of, the, of the essential ideas. Okay? It may be, that, and it may not be even longer than the, than, than the, original, uh, than the original mathematical text. But it's certainly not, remember, mathematics is a natural language. Just like all natural languages are full of, full of, full of things that are historical nastiness. You all know, for example, that cosine square x is cosine x times cosine x, right? Cosine to the minus 1x is not 1 over cosine x. It's because it's inconsistent. The language is like, like a natural language. It is a natural language. When you write as a program, you don't have that problem. Therefore, it's readable with less, less context. Okay. okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about. I hope that's, uh, that was at least fun.